Uh, Brian would like to know, uh, what actually is neon tetra disease? I've read somewhere online that it is some sort of protozoa-like parasite. Do we have an insight on that? Yes. Um, so neon tetra disease is a, it's a, a microsporidium. Um, oh, is it a parasite? Is it a fungus? Uh, th these microsporidia, they're really interesting. They sort of like, it seems like every couple of years they get reclassified. Um, the, the current classification is that they're most closely related to um, fungi. Um, but <laughs> I always think of them as parasites. So, uh, you know, what are they? No one knows. Um, you know, it'll change like the next time someone does a bunch of DNA sequencing on something. But um, what neon tetra disease is, is it's this, this microsporidian um, that forms um, these, um, oh gosh, my, my boss would kill me right now because I'm not going to use the correct, um, he, you know, <laughs> these veterinary pathologists are so proud because they'll like whip out like the exact um, correct word for, you know, a specific life stage of a parasite. And then I'm sitting there and I'm like, oof, I forgot that <laughs> after I read that. <laughs> you a textbook. You're on a live stream. So I can, um, can you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I'll have to, um, I'm, I'm not going to say anything so that it's not recorded um, as to what I forgot. But um, they make, a, um, you know, like a, a um, assist, I'll call it. That's not what it is. <laughs> um, that's full of these little um, microsporidia like inside of it. Um, and, and neon tetra disease is actually in the, um, oh, it's, I think it's called a zoonoma. Um, it's in the, the muscle. And so, you know, you see these neon tetras that get these like white um, sort of like lesions and then like they like, you know, waste away. Um, but but what it is, is it's, it's plastophora, which is a microsporidian that makes zoonomas in the muscle. And um, interesting thing about microsporidians, they are very hard to treat. So um, kind of like a parallel is um, pseudoloma in zebrafish. This is a huge problem in um, zebrafish research colonies. They get um, pseudoloma, which is a also a microsporidian that infects the uh, brain and spinal cord and um, they have put like so much work probably like tens of thousands of dollars into some of these facilities like testing culling and trying to eliminate this parasite from um you know these zebrafish colonies and it's extremely hard to do because they're vertically transmitted so essentially the, the thought is that they get transmitted um in the in the egg um and so it's like pretty hard if something is like inside <laughs> of the egg to um you know, deal with it. Mycobacterium, uh, that's another great example of something that's vertically transmitted. And so, um, yeah, neon tetra disease is a rough one um, because there's really not a great way to treat it. And um, the, you know, the microsporidian is like pretty um, infectious and, I, you know, the best thing you can do is like be disinfecting stuff. And I think this is probably, I would have to double check. Um, there's a really nice resource I think from the Southern Regional Aquaculture Center, but it might be on Dr. Yunong's, um, the Florida Tropical Aqu Aquaculture Lab Extension publications, but it talks about the different UV dosages um, that will treat um, different like fish pathogens. And um, I would guess that if you had UV filtration on your tank, it would help remove some of that from the water column. But I would have to double check that on the, um, the, little, the little table that I also haven't memorized. <laughs> All right, so we've definitely got some follow-up questions that have come through that little bit there. Uh, just let me find them. <clears throat> uh, cool. So, uh, microbacterium, is UV sterilization in the water column effective at all? And is it possible to treat it in any system without a complete teardown and sterilization? Jen is, is the, a lot of talk on, on UV during this, yes. so we can, yeah. Jen yeah. is the genius. She she dealt with this. She just, yeah. she knows what's up. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, yeah, we, we wrote about this one because um, we know, yeah, we should have a couple pieces on, on Myco um, just because we know this one is scary for people because it's considered zoonotic and people are concerned that they could, you know, be infected. Um, but yeah, so a um, couple things, you know, when I worked at the aquarium, mycobacteriosis, mycobacterium was in the system. It was just there. There was no way we we're going to get rid of that. And so when fish were extremely old um, or, you know, low on the social hierarchy or had other issues uh, going on, 
um, sometimes they would be infected with that. Um, and sometimes a fish might die from, you know, a seemingly unrelated cause. We'd send it out for necropsy and find it. Oh, yeah. And it also had myco. It's like, yep, it's just in there. There were some fish um, who did poorly. There's certain types of rainbow fish, for example, um, where they just couldn't cope with it. Um, and so, you know, um, there are some species differences with susceptibility. Um, but, you know, what we mentioned earlier about um, with a friend of ours who had fish um, that ended up having myco and we didn't even realize that was the problem. Um, part of what was going on there was um, these were there were platies um, who, who basically you know bred themselves into being overpopulated um, in her aquarium. Um, so great, great success followed by by some problems. Um, and we were able to get a handle on it by using UV, one of these small internal UV um, filters. The idea that you could break down and sterilize your entire aquarium, get rid of myco and then like start fresh and not have myco, um, it just doesn't work. It doesn't work and it's not worth really your time in doing that because you could do all that and you can go to the store and buy a perfectly healthy appearing fish of like literally any species and you could be bringing back myco again. Um, also, it's extremely hard to destroy it, you know, with any of the disinfectants to get into every single nook and cranny, not possible. So myco is really something to consider managing. Um, and again, you know, back to what can you do to keep the fish's immune system as strong as possible with all the environmental factors, the social factors, behavioral factors, um, you know, nutritional, all of this stuff. Um, and then minimizing the, the, population of, you know, mycobacterium that your fish might encounter in the wall water column in their environment through hygiene and through UV um, can be pretty effective, actually. And it's also um, like another thing to think about mycobacteria is that, I mean, they can just be in the, in the biofilm of like your plumbing coming into your house and, and they can just be like in in the water naturally. Um, so it's 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 like not it is absolutely not realistic to think, I mean, you could get yeah, bleach the whole tank and the second you put more water in it, because <laughs> the water coming out of your faucet isn't sterile. Mm -hmm. So uh, you could mm -hmm. just immediately put in more um, mycobacteria. So yeah, it's it's really it's really hard because like you see people asking questions about it. And, um, you know, first of all, um, it's probably worth like getting a definitive diagnosis on that if you can, you know, just to be 100% sure that that's what it is. Because there are other things that could look like mycobacteria you know, that you might handle a little bit differently. <laughs> For example, like columnaris, which was what we thought these fish had. Um, but, um, but like, once you know it's mycobacteria, um, it, it's probably not a good idea to like nuke everything and, um, and, and do like a full disinfection because you'll, you may just end up back in the same place. <laughs> and I think we mentioned in our piece, though, too, like it is possible if you've got fish who are like heavily, affected by it. Um, you know, they're very skinnier. They've got a lot of outward signs. By that point, um, it might be difficult or impossible to recover that fish. And it's possible that you might be in a position that you need to consider culling um, that fish or fishes, you know, out of the population. Um, so and while correcting those other things and trying to minimize the resurgence of it and, um, you know, just going through that management approach. So because those fish are likely to be heavily, like to be shedding a lot of the bacteria into the environment um, and therefore creating more of it uh, to be, for the other fish to be exposed to. It's actually, um, someone did this really cool paper because one of the problems I had um, when I was working with salmon hatcheries was like, you'd like go and there would be like, you know, if they had some kind of disease going on and there's fish dying and you'd look in and you're like, oh my God, you guys, like you got to take out the sick fish, please just, can you take, take out the dead fish, you know, take out the sick fish. And if that means that like someone has to stand there all day doing it, it's worth it. And, um, someone did like the best paper ever where he took a, a, a dead salmon that had died from, um, bacterial cold water disease, which is caused by a bacteria that's related to columnaris. And he looked at how many bacteria that one dead fish released into the water and how many subsequent fish it could infect. And it was something like that one fish could like infect like 100 to 200 fish a day. And so I wow. think that there's something it's, it's amazing. I mean, that's like the worst part of the whole thing is the those sick fish. And so it's absolutely so important like if a fish is not doing well take it out <laughs> and even if you end up having to treat your hospital tank and your main tank at least it's not in there just like like bombing the rest of your fish with 
you know, pathogens. Um, I'm actually remembering, because Jen was talking about how, like, when you work at a public aquarium and you're always, like, looking down in these tanks and you can't tell, like, what's in there. One time, uh, Scott sent me out front, like, with, like, a laser pointer because we were trying to take out this one salmon. And we were trying to, like, laser point at it so the person behind the tank could, like, try to scoop out. It didn't work. Um, but, um, <laughs> so, you know, hopefully, like, if they're sick, they're, like, easier to, like, catch and take oh, out. Oh, sometimes they find a bit of energy, though. I can tell you <laughs> that. <do>. So, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, no, it's, it's really – it's it's totally worth removing sick fish. And, and we also have something in there about, um, like, humane euthanasia because – you know, this is actually, I think one of the hardest things about being a fish vet is a lot of the times by the time, like people have called me about fish, they're really sick. Like it's, um, it's just, they're beyond my ability to do anything. Um, you know, I'm thinking about things like dropsy where they get like, um, you know, they're in like systemic organ failure. That's mm -hmm. really not something that you're going to be able to like fix. Um, and, and so we do have a resource about that as well. Cause that's, I mean, that's kind of a sad, hard thing to do. And if you're gonna, you know, have to call fish, you want to do it in the most humane way possible. So we do also have a resource about that. Um, but I think that as hard as it is to do, that's like a super underestimated thing to do when you have sick fish is just to get them out of where all the other fish are. 